Hey everybody, it's your buddy Beard Grizzly, and today is a very different type of lore video. I say that now and again, I suppose, and sometimes I think that it's, you know, going to actually be the different type, but no, I think I mean it this time. Today I wanted to have a general discussion about, well, a couple things pertaining to a few newer tabs that have been introduced to us over Warmind, and they all pertain back to the Ares 1 crew. First off, since this is more of a discussion, I wanted to actually come to you guys unscripted. So this, again, is one of those rare moments that I don't have anything really in front of me. Kind of. If you're not familiar with it, I actually have a few journals that I now write in, and I reference back to often when it comes down to Destiny lore information. It's my way, my teaching tool if you will, and my way of remembering things, to make sure that I know what's going on within the universe. It's why I can call back on information as quickly as I can, or at least in some cases can try. Additionally, if you do hear any voice cracks or anything like that, I'm gonna try to keep myself caught on those, but my voice is still trying to get better from what I had talked about before with my allergies. I'm not going to harp on that topic too much, but just know it's been a really tough last week, and I'm hoping to rectify that and get a lot more content to you guys because I've got a lot more time coming up. But anyway, now that we're about two minutes into this, let's actually get into these topics and start talking about what it is that's going on with these, these tabs, because... My goodness, whoever's over at Bungie that wrote these, you've got a couple things to keep in mind. One of the biggest is the simple fact that you can't talk about time in two to three different sequences within the same lore tab. It's confusing as all get out. So before we get into this, I'm going to explain why some of these are kind of a pain in the neck to kind of read, and it's a summary that I actually wrote down. So, I'm going to read that word for word. Originally, these cards read as completely out of order and very hard to distinguish timestamps or otherwise. This is due to the writing style that is involved with some of these entries. Unlike previous entries, we will look at these in date order, not class order. This will allow a slightly better understanding of buildup within these lore tabs. The flavor text seems to be the only thing that has an order to it, and that order seems closer to a stance of values than much else amongst the three crew members. It tells a bit about each member's personality, which lines up with the class-related armor that they have. Additionally, reading these like a movie told in first person musters a better understanding of the delineations that exist. Imagine the narrative of Deadpool's first half and then it cuts around back to the current events time period of the movie. Most of these logs are also supplemental, which carries that they are to enhance or shed more light on a story or series of events. There was a theory that was going around for a while that the original opening movie to Destiny was something that was actually caught in a Vex log or Vex timescape, if you will. It was something where it seemed like everything was popping up from different points in time, and nothing seemed like it was quite right about it. That theory carried immediately over to these lore tabs and the fact that they read so weird, and a large majority of them actually don't fit the bill very much. And that's actually why I want to have this extended discussion, and I'm going to read every single lore tab, and I'm going to also read every single entry that I've written down here in my book, to give you an idea and hopefully shed understanding on what it is that's actually going on, to give more of a clear sense of what it is that's happening within these lines. Why this is so important is because this is where time starts for us within Destiny. And if something were to be the case where there were multiple timelines that existed within Destiny's start, then the ideas of some of the lore that we have would have to be analyzed almost like a Legend of Zelda time scale after Ocarina of Time started. And that is a level of nerd and time ideas that I don't think I'm, I'm fully prepared for. Again, I'm going to read down every single lore tab, so if you guys just want to listen to this in the background or anything like that, I'm going to take care of you guys. This is going to be a very long video and a very long discussion topic, but, well, I'm ready, so here we go. The first one is on Hardy's Steps. This is actually 517 days until launch for Ares. 
And what we actually find here is a communication room that happens, uh, or communication that happens between a few individuals that seem to be either at NASA or elsewhere. I should also note that this is one of the inst entries, the instant entries, I guess you could say, that are not marked as supplemental, which means that it is the start of it all and gives you more of like a beginning point for the actual log. Director Canterbury. Can someone get the lights? Hardy. Mr. Canterbury, I notice your wife was still giving a toast out there. Dr. Canterbury, yes, I know. Thank you all for breaking away from the party. Evie. Now, if you'll all look at the screen. General Fiedler. Can we get some introductions? Hardy. Special flight services. I'm like, never here. I don't know anybody. General Fiedler. And you are? E. Evie, sir. Evie Calumet. Director Canterbury, Evie's one of our leading theoretical physicists. She has something important to show security services. Hardy, okay. Evie, this, this shape you see. Hardy, it was important to show me a moon? Evie, not a moon. The weight's wrong. And anyway, it shouldn't be there. Hardy, is that planet beside it? Evie, Jupiter. Does everybody get that? This thing just appeared in our solar system, and it's anybody's guess why. General Fiedler. What are its capabilities? Director Canterbury. So far, we don't know. Maybe it's just a roving satellite. Maybe it's something a lot scarier. As you could expect, this card's a little bit more straightforward. It just showcases the idea of what is actually happening within the starts of when we find the Traveler, or as we'll come to find as it's called later down the line, Moon X, originally. And this is something to kind of keep in mind as we kind of dig through these logs, but that's basically the only thing that this card kind of sets up. It's just the basis for the idea of them finding the Traveler and what Evie had actually done to actually find it out there. But there are a couple of extra points that really need to be discussed, and that happens with Hardy's journey, which is the next point in time. This is actually 480 days to launch, so it's a supplemental amount of time between everything that had happened. Anyway, let's get to reading the card first before I get into that. Evie. Jacob, you got a minute? Hardy. A minute, but then I gotta go. There's a thing in Belarus. I should be back Monday. Evie. If you're in a hurry, can I have your brownie? Hardy. You can have half. What did you want to show me? Evie. Moon X is back. Hardy. Oh, boy. Oh, we saw what it did to Jupiter. Or with. You could think of it as with Jupiter. Whatever, the thing made some major changes to two of Jupiter's moons. Yep, then it blinks out. Gone, 14 months. Then Mercury, then blinks out, 7 months. And you can't track it. Oh, I think I may have a way. But right now, that doesn't matter because guess what just showed up hanging out next to Venus? You're kidding. I wish. Let me see that. What's it going to do there? I don't know. Magic, I guess. You know what really worries me? Next time it blinks out? Where does it go? Where does it go? You can have the rest of my brownie. Now, this makes me stop and think for a second. This is one of the first major parts that we start having problems with timing. The time, just to remind you, back for the original period that we had seen with the last Hardy Steps entry was 517 days. This is only up at 480 days, which basically gives it a 37-day difference. This is weird to kind of talk about at this point because this means that they've been monitoring what has been going on with the Traveler, or Moon X, for a very long time. So this is where things get to be a little weird to talk about, and how do we justify that this situation is kind of as it is? And again, I'm going to reach back towards my journals that I have here. We have our first major problem with timing here, as Evie talks about time periods between the Traveler's appearances. Let's take a look. Jupiter, first known location, altered two moons, blinks out for 14 months, appears over Mercury after one year and two months, and then blinks out again for another seven months before now appearing above Venus. The time period from steps to journey is only 37 days. If Evie showed the General and Hardy, the Traveler, right when it showed up, that would put time between these encounters to one year and nine months. I could wonder if they simply needed better images of the Traveler to actually report on it, but then it would have appeared at Mercury for a good look. 
perhaps we only saw portions of the meeting that were discussed 37 days prior. This is the only way I could quantify this data, but to keep it from security services for over a year and a half seems very wrong. Then again, we today don't count everything we see until the second moment we see it for confirmation as well. Just an anomaly, move on. That would make sense, but still wouldn't account for the seven-month blink-out from Mercury to Venus, unless we just weren't looking. Additionally, this would mean the Traveler was around Jupiter twice or more often. Ganymede, Europa, Io. Io was apparently the last one that was changed, as we know from current lore. We also saw that the Traveler was around Mercury, the same time the Vex showed up, if Osiris' vision in the forest, the Infinite Forest, can be trusted. This would have been before humanity knew what was going on, so could we have perceived the Vex to be native because of this? Venus' arrival would also allow for this, at least with the Traveler arriving around Venus. Could this surmise that the Vex turned Mercury much later on instead of immediately when they showed up? And again, just to kind of cover this point, it just means that we don't generally look out at space or even within our solar system all that often. This concept, this idea is not out there, I think, but it's the only way that I could really summate why this difference in time period kind of exists, because the other one does definitely feel like it was 517 days prior, and then all of a sudden here we've got another month that goes by, and now we're concerned with Venus. This is where part of these bad explanations kind of come from, and why setting this time period up as importantly as it is, well, it doesn't really gauge for or have a lot of wiggle room. Again, if we start talking about multiple timelines or anything like that, now all of a sudden we devalue a lot of the lore that's actually out there. The next up is Chow's passing, and this is one that we have to kind of dig into a little bit deeper because it is also a little on the confusing side. What we actually find is that this is a supplemental entry coming from the Journal of Ulysses Chow, son of Dean Chow of Beijing University, navigator of the Ares One. So, it's a bit confusing to some that's not following the, the overall syntax here, but this is coming from the son of Dean Chow. And Dean is not his first name, it's just the title, or at least I'm assuming. It, it might be both, for all we know, it might be both. Maybe that was his overall goal in life, was to actually make Dean Chow mean something, so he became the dean of a university. Anyway, this is 476 days till launch. And per that point, again, this kind of separates it by only realistically a few days from the prior entry. The last one was 480 days, so four days later, they decided to launch images of the Traveler. And again, this is from Ulysses Chow, the son of the Chow that we know of through the rest of this story. We were in the Rathskeller. If you don't know what it is, I didn't at the time, but it's sort of a restaurant and bar underground, not far from the bookstore. Hundreds of years old. This wasn't Beijing. Back then, we lived in Australia, Sydney. And I had gone to have lunch with Dad at the university where he was teaching. So I'd brought all this information about looking for colleges. I remember we had holograms floating all around the table while we ate pizza, and it was a great time, you know? Anyway, there was this TV play, and that was the first time we saw it drone footage from the edge of the solar system. Something had come in that no one had expected. My dad looked up and he just froze, like his mind just flipped on and he was lost. He would get like that. That was the first time we saw the thing that everyone eventually called the Traveler. So really, we get a couple of things here, which is kind of cool. One, we understand that this may not necessarily be like present day today, Earth, this seems like sometime still in the future. And the nicety with that is because we've, or at least the reason behind that, I should say, is because of these holograms that we're being kind of presented with or talked about over. And to me, that kind of says that there's a little bit more technology that's advanced over time. So we don't have holograms just yet. We're getting there, but not just yet. 
In case you're wondering about the Rathskeller, Rathskeller is actually a pretty open word. Uh, from what I found out, there's a couple of them within driving distance of me, for instance, so it's just a, a commonplace term and word. There may be one in Sydney, Australia that I don't know about that I didn't end up finding, but in case there is, you know that you can look back on it a little bit. But what's important to keep in mind here is that they actually showed the Traveler four days after it popped up over Venus again on national television. And this is pretty big news. I should also mention that this is actually being talked about as an after image or after journal entry after the Traveler had actually arrived on Earth or otherwise, or at least after they had found the thing, I suppose. But that being said, it's just a highlight that some of these entries are during the events that happen and some are after the events that happen. So the events are the key thing to keep in mind here, not necessarily the interpretations. Interpretations could be a little fouled up, except for a couple instances, but again, if they're like audiovisual records or something like that, conversations back and forth between each other that are recorded, that I think we can still take as being truthful. Meanwhile, again, there are some journal entries that are written after the fact that we need to kind of keep in mind. That idea continues throughout these entries, and the next one that we have with Hardy's Calm showcases that same idea. It's also interesting because this carries on towards a very larger time period, or very big large time difference, because we go from 476 days out to 90 days out to launch. This is reconciling an idea at three months before launch. And this is the first time that we start to hear of a few different things that are going on. 90 days to launch. Project Catamaran. This is also the first time that we see the project name of Catamaran, or at least if I recall right. Additionally, this is still a supplemental entry, so it's to enhance the entries that we have so far, especially that first one that we had seen. Been here a week and the clubhouse feels like home now. Everyone in one another's spaces, everyone with their own work to do. Wish I had the same faith in humanity. That riot between competing Moon X cults and New Orleans is not a good sign. The crew is everything they were sold as. The Navigator, his name is Chow, is one of the most inquisitive men I've ever met. He has a curiosity that makes his whole face glow. Mihalilova is working on the AI of the ship. She's very serious. Trained well enough to treat the team with respect, but you can tell she's not interested in answering questions from lesser intellects, which is probably most of us, at least in her field. Evie could give her a run for her money, I'll bet. Evie, whose theories on tracking the Moon X gave us the first jump on where we could go to meet it. She just looked this way. I guess she can tell I'm writing about her. So, correction on my end, I remembered this a little bit wrong. But, yeah, this means basically that this is something that's happening during the events of Project Catamaran. They're all settled in, of course, in the clubhouse, and they're all basically getting ready to go. The clubhouse is basically the place that everybody is going to be merging with and so on, and this is just to kind of keep the team housed for when Ares 1 is about ready to launch, or I should say Project Catamaran, my fault. But to the point, about how long has this been? Now, it's been a year and 30 days since the Traveler was shown over national news. We are unsure of what has happened with the Traveler, but we now, 90 days from launch, know where the Traveler will be, which, as we know, is Mars. The trouble of this is, why does Hardy talk about them before seeing them? And this is again to kind of talk about the idea of the, the Deadpool example that I gave beforehand, where he's up on the bridge, he's talking about what's actually going on, he's like, Hi, you're probably wondering why I'm in this situation. Well, let me tell you why. And that's where this is kind of going from. Again, I think that this is kind of poorly written and at least designed, but after we get done reading the rest of them, you, you might understand what I mean. The idea here is that at 90 days to launch, the team is picked. That's the ideas that I think they're trying to get across here, and really, I think where I can leave the entry. So, let's move on. And that carries on a little bit into the next one with Mihalilova's Instruments, which is actually going over a little bit of her thesis and theory, which, granted, kind of needs to be talked about on its own, but I do want to read this card all the same. Path to Ares, 75 days to launch, from Mihalilova. 
This is actually a letter in response to some of the other colleagues that she's with to actually work on AI, because that is her field of study. Colleagues, I read with interest your article on the work at the Uppsala Center on the use of AI in aiding emergency medical workers during the recent tsunamis in Japan. In light of the news of that large, mysterious moon, satellite, ship, entering our solar system, I do not agree that AI can be of help in more than logistics. It can make people safe. I feel certain that this Moon X is an intelligence, perhaps an AI, and I don't feel safe with it at all. Do you? But bear this in mind, for our own AI to serve as well, it will need secrets too. For AI to serve humanity, we must feel comfortable. And for us to feel comfortable, we must never know the truth, that we have a servant who would surpass us if ever it desired. Of course it won't, because we control it, but we should not doubt that it is a necessary subterfuge nonetheless. Sincerely, Dr. M. Mihalilova, Nicholas and Alexandra University. So again, being that Warmind is all about talking about Rasputin and so on, to kind of hear Mihalilova's ideas on AI is of significant interest to the Warmind story, but not for what we're talking about today. So again, let's move on. Mihalilova's choice, on the other hand, is what actually kind of gets the gears rolling, especially when you think back to Hardy's column and how he was talking about them all being together. Path to Ares, 65 days to launch. Remember this. Hardy's Calm was 90 days to launch, and this was the start of where things got confusing. Loud crashing noise, apparently a slamming office door. Mihalilova, have you seen my lab? What in the world is going on? Provost, have they already been in? Who's they? The computers are gone. The cabinets have been emptied out. Oh, well, this isn't how it was supposed to go, Dr. Mihalilova. Please, sit. I will not sit. What's happening? Have I been terminated? What are you people, for heaven's sake? No, your equipment is safe. It's been moved. You've been chosen to design the AI for the catamaran mission. I'm in the middle of my research here. Well, now you're going to continue it there. And look, you'll be a household name. I don't have any interest in that. Ah, but they're interested in you. Hang on. What? I just sent you your itinerary. You're on a flight, Dr. Mihalilova. This afternoon. You're going to meet your computers at Central Command in Florida. Look at it this way. You'll get some sun. Now, obviously, what I'm thinking is Central Command would probably be Cape Canaveral and so on, but we don't necessarily have any full backing for that. That being said, I'm taking an educated guess because, well, it's kind of where we launch most of our shuttles, rockets, etc. from at this point. On a side note, I do find this funny that it's called Mihalilova's Choice, and she really doesn't have much of a choice. <laughs> I think that's kind of just the ironic part of it all, though. But we'll move on to the next one, which is Hardy's Orders. And again, 65 days from launch, Mihalilova was forcibly moved over to Florida. Meanwhile, Hardy doesn't get the message until 63 days to launch, and that is what's going over with Hardy's orders. Additionally, if you do read this card at the top, it'll say 0746. I have a feeling that this is just military time. It always reads this way, 0746, which is be 746 in the morning. It could be more of a designate time for either GMT or otherwise, but we don't necessarily know. All that I know is that at 746 for Jacob Hardy, he got this message. Anyway, let's talk about the message. Hardy. Okay, whoever this is, you have 30 seconds. The whole point of vacationing at the bottom of the ocean is to avoid calls. General Fiedler. It's Fiedler, Hardy. Oh, yes, sir. It's about Moon X. Sir? Your friend Evie was right. It's almost impossible to track, but she has a way, and now it showed up right where she said it would be. Inbound to Mars. Did you copy? It's going to be on Mars. You saw what it did to Jupiter and Mercury and Venus. So, we want to send a multinational crew to intercept it. Multinational? You'll be the pilot of the craft. Uh, look, I don't disagree with the idea, but Mars is 50 million kilometers away. Give or take, yeah. The mission will have to depart from Mars in two months. 60 days. 60 days. So enjoy your vacation, and then get back here. 
We're building a clubhouse and a ship. We're going to catch this sucker. So again, just to wrap this back over towards what we had with Hardy's Calm, he had said 90 days out that the team was selected. But it wasn't until about another month that it seemed like either they were trained for it or there were other needed necessities that needed to be taken care of. Like, of course, building the actual rocket or starting to work on the actual Ares craft or catamaran craft as we actually know it right now. So keep that in mind as we kind of go along here. Again, this is 63 days to launch. So we'll move into Chow Strides. Oh, before I forget to mention it, yes, the Traveler was, of course, around Jupiter, Mercury, and Venus before it ended up going to Mars. So that's another thing to add to the Traveler's travel book, if you will, just to keep tabs on it. Chow Strides are the ones that actually made me almost lose my damn mind. The idea behind them is that at 58 days to launch, we see that a student is talking with Dean Chow about the encounter with the Traveler and about Project Catamaran. But it didn't read proper to me, and I wasn't thinking of it as like an after effect kind of thing. So keep that in mind. Again, that's that's where this is going. It's an after report from when they had actually found the Moon X and actually met up with the Traveler. So keep that in mind, because after I read it that way, it started to make a lot more sense. Student, Dean Chow, thank you for answering all these questions about Ares 1. Chow, no, thank you, I love it. Do you remember where you were when you first heard about the mission? Huh. I do remember where I was when I got the call. It wasn't called Ares then, of course. Until around launch day, it was called Project Catamaran. Anyway, my oldest daughter was applying to the university and we had flown in from our home in Sydney to visit. We had lunch with some professors and afterwards we visited one of the dorms. Just over there. It's not there anymore. Thank God. It was an old dorm. There were protests all over that day. The Moon X cults were in full force, calling for all governments to combine. I took the call and the drone we rented for the day. They wanted me to cut the visit short, but I refused. They wanted me to be gone for a year and a half. They could wait until morning. So at 58 days until launch, Chow is informed of the part he will play in Catamaran. His daughter was in Sydney to check for colleges. This is where Chow had heard the call before going to Florida. Something not mentioned from previous, Moon X cults were formed due to the Traveler's arrival. Fights broke out, a lot of the end is nigh kind of stuff. And that's the biggest thing to keep in mind with these, with these points, at least that are brought up here with the strides. One, we see these ideas, and granted, I know that Hardy's Calm had talked about them too, these Moon X cults had started to form. After it went live on national television, it seems like this was one of the biggest things that it wanted to at least kind of populate within the overalls of people, you know, not sure what's going on. So they, of course, get uppity about it because, <laughs> you know, that that never happens. The end is nigh and so on. Ugh, getting Watchmen flashbacks here and all of a sudden everybody's just a bunch of Rorschachs. Anyway, the other idea to still talk about this, of course, would be that Ares 1 is being brought up 58 days to launch. Or is it? No. This is simply saying that this is when Dean Chow was actually given his call to actually join the team for Project Catamaran. So, a little less than two months out, and Chow is finally interested, or at least told, that he needs to show up over in Florida. He's the one that was selected. So that's how this reads. Very confusing to me at first, and it seems like it was very confusing to everybody else, so... I felt like I wasn't losing my mind too much, but apparently we were all losing our minds. So at this point, this is when we start to have things snowball. We start to really get a lot of entries, kind of quick and fast in terms of how many days out they are from launch. So the next one is Chow's Care, and it's 30 days from launch. And this is actually a pretty important entry for a couple reasons, but you'll see why. I know, I'm probably saying that about most of them. I, I feel like I am, but it's just the, the phrase that I kind of fall back on. Anyway, stopping now, let's read this. So again, this is Chow's Care, and it's still marked Project Catamaran, Path to Ares, 30 days to launch. Hardy. What, you don't play basketball? Chow, of course I do. Hardy. Okay, so me and Mihalilova against you and Evie. Evie, I'll oh, we'll wipe the floor with you. 
Mahalilova, don't be so sure. Hardy, how's the nav coming? Chow, all told, beautiful. With Mihai's AI and Evie's theories, Evie, we don't want to accidentally run into it. Hardy, it? Evie, Moon X. Mihalilova, ah! Evie, too slow. Hardy, hey, no traveling. Evie, sorry. Chow, got it. Hardy, not so fast. Chow, two points. You want to talk about fast? Evie, wait, wait. Hardy, huh, okay. What? Evie, traveling. Moon X. Look, we need to stop even thinking of it as a satellite or a false moon. It's big, but it acts alive. This thing moves with purpose. It's a visitor. It's a traveler. And so, of course, we get the really corny means in which the traveler gets its human name, and that's all thanks to a basketball game in which Evie ends up traveling. <laughs> I don't know what I think about this one, but, you know, we'll, we'll let it go, I suppose. It's still a, a quaint way of sh kind of showcasing that this is something that, and a means of them actually coming up with a name. But what's weird about this is that this was a name that was given to it in pre-Golden Age. And that's the important thing to kind of carry on. If we didn't forget the Traveler's name, how how much more do we have that is actually remembered by us over the course of time? If, if I'm making sense by this, let me say it another way. Uh, the idea that we now today, post-collapse, have actually forgotten a large majority of what happened during the Golden Age and the Collapse. But yet we for, we remember, we remember the Traveler's name. Does that make sense on why I find that to be such a big deal? That's just a, a permeated idea that I've, I've had for a little while when reading this. It's a pre-Golden Age name. So always remember that whenever you think back to the Traveler. But moving on with this snowball effect that we're having, Mihalilova's triumph is 20 days away from launch for the Path to Ares. And this one gets... Very interesting. Again, I said interesting. God, I gotta stop that! For clarification, before we actually get invested into this, this is a journal entry, and it seems to be happening on that day, at 20 days to launch. That's why some of these get to be kind of hard to read, because to distinguish between the ones that are written during the fact and afterward, it's hard to keep up in some ways. Anyway, carrying on. 20 days to launch, Mihalilova's Triumph. The situation with E becomes increasingly tenuous. She insists she needs access to all the AI code for her gravity well measurements, which I find highly unlikely. It's simply not necessary, and I've given her all the subroutine code that she could possibly need. But she wants it all. It's absurd. What would she make of the R subsystems if she saw them? R. That's what I've codenamed the deepest core of the experimental AI at the heart of the new ship. And he's doing very well, now writing his own codes. Off the charts well. Would E even understand? Likely she'd go running to Hardy, show him some of the odder items where R has written some of his own code and seems to be, how can I put it, passing judgment on us like a little hidden critic. No. The AI must be protected so that he can function best in the limited way we need. Not sure how to keep her away, but giving her access could be catastrophic. Now again, this kind of falls back on a couple different instances that I do need to kind of showcase a little later on, but I did at least want to make sure we had a full record of reading these Ares 1 crew uh, tabs, just to make sure that it's all here. Again, this kind of falls back on different theories, like R being Rasputin. But we're not necessarily sure how all that's going to go, and I still have some other ideas, so let's move on before I get really carried away and talk about them. Chow's Grin is the next one that we're going to have, and this one is 18 days to launch. This is actually where things get to be a little catastrophic, as Mihalilova puts it. So again, Coming from a record from Chow, 18 days to launch for Ares. Mihalilova and Evie continue to have conflict that is completely unnecessary. It puts a strain on the clubhouse. I know Jacob is trying to get a handle on it. The latest is this ridiculous argument about the subroutines of the AI code. Evie wants to get a look at all of Mihalilova's code to make sure it takes into account the gravity measurements she's making to plot the possible movements of the Traveler. Traveler. 
Yeah, such a perfect name. Go Evie. Anyway, Mihaly Lova simply refuses to unlock all of her code. Not outright, of course. She just deflects, under-delivers, won't let Evie into the whole thing. I'm not interested in this conflict. I have my own ways around unlocking every piece of code in the onboard systems, so I gave Evie access. I mentioned it afterward to Mihaly Lova, and I expected her to react badly. But of course, things don't always work out the way you expect. She got very quiet and said, Well, ciao. What's done is done. So, not only, of course, is this a little bit of foreshadowing that happens, but I should mention that the E that was mentioned in the previous uh, Mihaly Lova's Triumph is most likely, of course, Evie, as we see now. They kind of all reference themselves as like E or M or Q, and it's just a means to keep things kind of simple or otherwise, I suppose. I don't know if that shows that they're just not getting along very well or what, but anyway, getting carried along on this, this idea. But what Chow shows is that he's actually opened up a means to actually hack into Mihaly Lova's code 18 days till launch. Again, kind of an important note to make sure of, but it still kind of follows along with the timeline that we're still presented with. Again, looking at it as the ways that we have been this whole time, everything's falling into place properly. At least, thankfully. I, I hate telling you guys how to read these things, but to me, this is something that's very important. Again, just to drive home the idea that if the base is wrong, then we have to question everything about Destiny's lore. So, this base, important. The next piece is Mihalilova's tail. This one is three days to launch, and it's, uh, well, we're getting down to go time. We're danger red area, if you will. Evie, listen, I wanted to talk to you alone. Mihalilova, all right. Have you read some of these outputs? I think there are some serious errors here. Don't be absurd. You've got, it's got these code caches, and it's, M, it's creating assessments of us. Of the project, of the crew. It commented on Chow's snoring when he was asleep. Look, here. Did you print that out? Of course. Okay, all right. So what do you propose? Bringing it to Hardy. Uh, of course. What's that supposed to mean? I mean, look, uh, you're right. It must be an error. This is all embarrassing. Let me see if I can fix it. Give me a day. We don't have a day. Twelve hours, then. Let me try to locate the problem. And if I can't, of course, we'll take it to the whole team. Are you certain you can? Oh, I have to. Twelve hours. By then, I swear, we'll have it all squared away. So the next tab to check out is called Hardy's Control. And keep in mind what this one says. Path to Ares 1, launch day, plus one. It also does mention that the project name is now switched to Project Ares 1. FKA Catamaran. FKA is formerly known as, just for reference. And this is where things get to be a little bit more on the dark side with this story. This is another entry from Hardy himself, but this one actually seems to be in the moment. So keep that in mind again as we're reading it. This one is actually happening on launch day plus one, or at least is happening somewhere around there. We're 24 hours late. I've never seen the crew in such a crappy mood. It was so... stupid. An electrical fire in a clubhouse stairwell. One minute, Evie's putting some final touches on her calculations and was heading off to do a telecast about the effort of flash erosion on coastal tides, and the next... We didn't even notice she was gone. We learn about cascading effects, how catastrophe comes from one thing stacking onto another. A fried electrical system, a weak sprinkler, smoke... No one else paying attention. A spill in the stairwell, making the step slippery. Our safe cocoon became a death trap. Of course, we're still going. But Evie put us here, and now we're going to meet the Traveler without her. The truth is, I know I'll lose myself in the amazement of it all. I will. I know it. But just remember, I felt this way. One more thing. They've given us guns and renamed us. Something about... Needing to be ready for the worst. An accident occurs, pushing back the mission and renaming the mission from Catamaran to Ares 1. The questionable thing is that this is done in a day, but this may be for another particular reason. Evie seems to have been hurt or killed during this accident. Some theorize that R, 
is the cause of this issue, and that may play into my theory a bit more. The theory I haven't really told you guys yet. But let's continue research. Now keep in mind that a lot of this actually plays back to the Humans cards as well, the Humans Grimoire cards. And a lot of this plays back to Hardy not necessarily liking the idea of them carrying guns with them. And you still kind of see that he likes this instance and wants to highlight that instance, but in a lot of his talks, or at least his highlights, he doesn't bring up Evie. And that's kind of questionable. It's questionable on several levels, but it's questionable for a few different ones. Anyway, for timeline reasons, however, the thing that we're concerned with, things are still moving just fine. And this moves us over to Chow's heart. And then we move on to Chow's heart, one of the last couple that we have to actually talk about. This one is still at launch day plus one, and actually seems like it's happening on the inside of the Ares 1 cockpit. So, let's give this a read. Sencom. Ares, this is Sencom. Radio check. Radio check, over. Hardy, CENTCOM, this is Ares-1. We read you loud and fairly clear, over. CENTCOM, roger. Hey, just so you know, the uh, House of Eternal Travel has sent it you its prayers. It was all over the news. Hardy, that one of those traveler cults? CENTCOM, roger. This is the one that survived the traveler cult rumble a few weeks ago. Hardy, oh, well, okay. Tell them thanks. CENTCOM, roger. Next radio check, eight minutes. Hardy, I'll be quiet for now. Nav, Chow, steady. We are clear of Earthgrav, confirming course. Engineering, Mihailova, all systems normal. Hardy, okay, so now it's a long wait. Chow, hey, you okay, Jacob? Hardy, yeah, hey, okay. Chow, look at the stars. Mihailova, is there a problem? Chow, not at all, it's just... Hardy. Beautiful. Chow. Yes, like something we are privileged to join, but could never deserve. Hardy. Wonder how the Traveler must feel. So all the feels besides, this is just kind of keeping up with everything, and it's basically just showing that everything is moving forward, I guess you could say. Uh, the simple idea is that now we are going off to meet the Traveler, and everything seems A-OK, -okay up until the ending. Mihailova's Path is the final entry that we have of the Ares-1 crew, and there are a couple problems to denote from it, but we'll get there here in a moment. Keep in mind that this is only a partial entry, and there are a couple of things that we are not understanding about it. Additionally, this seems like it is after the Ares-1 crew returns from their encounter with the Traveler. So this may go in tandem with a couple of the uh, Human Grimoire cards as well. So there are a few things to keep in mind while we read over this a little bit. Mihalilova had to start a lot of that over. Insurance agent. Let's talk about your background. You were one of the heroes of the Ares-1, right? M. Heroes? <laughs> no, no, we were scientists. Very well. So, as a scientist, the system you designed, I designed the AI. And did the AI run the mission? Oh, no, it couldn't have back then. We had no idea what we were going to find. Moon X was a terraformer. We could run into oceans, storms, and indeed, landing was a mess. So we needed the best AI with extreme flexibility, because it would be better if Hardy could take the ship in his hands. Project Catamaran was secret and probably dead as soon as it started. Crazy to run out and meet something like that. It was good work. Most of the AI code I started there didn't really get used for the mission, but it came in handy. I mean, where do you think? Cuts off. i read where my thoughts are with this one from my book, but Mihalilova seems to be basking in the household name a bit more than she let on before. Mihalilova isn't able to finish her ending statement in the log. She's also double-speaking. She claims the AI was not ready for use on the Ares-1, but that they needed the most flexible AI possible. The AI was to help with Hardy's landing of the ship. Referring back to Humans 2, Hardy doesn't make mention of the AI, but he does say Mihalilova and Chow were the reason for the landing. Mihalilova's main reason for being was the AI, but also as an engineering position. Chow was largely responsible for navigation. 
Mihaly Lova speaks on some code being used by the AI, but not indicating the whole of R itself was utilized on the Ares craft. That basically ends a lot of the thoughts that I had through my journals, but to just kind of tie this back a little bit further, this statement can definitely be a little out there and questionable where it was within the timeline. There's also another piece of this that we're not seeing, and it's that good old-fashioned idea of, if I, you don't show me or tell me you saw a body, I'm not going to believe you. And I still do have a couple theories behind Evie and her possible death. But that is for an entirely different day. For now, the entire point of today's lecture and discussion, I call it a lecture, but it's really a discussion, sorry, is simply to get the idea of where these cards and entries are coming from. This whole idea of reading these was, was difficult, at least for me, and I have a feeling that it would have been somewhat difficult for some of you otherwise. So I wanted to make sure that this was discussed and talked about. But, as always, being that this is more of a discussion, I do want to open up the realm to you guys. Do you think that there is only this way of interpreting these cards? Or are there a number of other ways that we can look through all of this? Let me know in those comments below. Otherwise, if you guys like this video, you know the buttons to press and you know everything else that there is out there, blah blah blah, subscribe and so on. Thank you guys if you sat through this entire thing. Because I know that this is definitely something that was... I, I was thinking of making this more of a, a more contained idea, but honestly, after just starting to read and what I had focused on, I was like, you know what? We just need to read all these cards and get this as more of a discussion piece. So, anyway, I will shut up. It was great to just sit and chat with you guys again. It was great to exercise my voice a little bit more, too, with the being down on the dumps here for as long as I had been. Anyway, with this very long discussion piece out of the way, hopefully we can move on to something else. But to Guardians and non-Guardians alike, I'll see you next space time, and take care.